Scene 64, take one. Hi, Mom. <laughs> My name is Richard Duardo. Born and raised in Los Angeles, Boyle Heights, which is about two miles that way. And had a studio in Highland Park up to 1979. I was a printmaker that happened to do gig posters for the scene at the time, punk scene, with X, Fear, The Plugs, The Circle Jerks, oh my God, The Gears, and doing regular posters for graphic designers and fine artists that were showing up because of my reputation. But at one point I realized Highland Park was too far in downtown woods where it was happening. And as a printmaker, I thought, well, I gotta be where the action's happening. That was the early age of artists moving downtown, opportunity downtown, and desolate buildings. So I took my first studio, which was 10,000 square feet on the top of the Walnut Building. I had 10,000 square feet for $250. I don't even know how many pennies that breaks into per square foot. And I was a little bit more accessible to the West Side artists that were starting to hear about my reputation and my ability as a printmaker. But I was simultaneously doing my own poster work. I was trying to decide whether I wanted to be a fine art printer or go for the brass ring like everybody else downtown and try to make it as a fine artist. Being a typical Mexican where you do something safe, <laughs> I said, if I fail as an artist, at least I can always get a job as a printmaker. So I focused on printmaking. I had an apartment on Spring Street next to the Party Boys and across the hall from Carlos Amaras, the painter. That was where I lived. But I found that 10,000 square foot space on the top floor of the Diamond Walnut building that gave me also for free 10,000 square foot roof where I started to do punk shows up there with the city as a backdrop. And we started a record label, Tito La Riva from The Plugs, a Texas punk band that really became one of the seminal bands in the LA punk scene. We started a record label called Fatima Records and we produced, you know, half a dozen records. Pee Wee Herman was our classic one. Bob Biggs, who ran Slash Records, saying, you're all over the map here. You're doing records with East LA punk bands, and you're doing punk album with Pee Wee Herman. Yeah, why not? That's what I said. Why not right up to bankruptcy? <laughs> what the heck? If you were downtown in 1977 to 81, it was fairly desolate. You were one of the pioneers in a big cavernous loft with a gazillion homeless zombies outside and trying to be cool, right? And then at night, you'd have to find your community. The only place to drink downtown was the bar here on Hewitt Attraction. Elle's Bar was a place to meet and hang out with the locals that were still around and the beginning community of artists getting to know who's parked where around the neighborhood. It came up that the Rollins, Fred Rollins and George Rollins, picked up the Angeles Desk Company across the street from Mel's Bar. I basically leased the whole second floor and divided it into three studios. And then I was in there from 1981 to 1992. It was an interesting time. Mike Kanemitsu, one of the ABEX superstars from New York, was two floors above me. Peter Zecker doing extraordinary sculptures was three floors above me. Michelle and me is across the street with Richard Newton, the performance artist. So it's just a cauldron of energy. I just happened to be just another component of it. In my fine art production studio, I became like a fledging small business that wound up hiring the hungry artists across the street living at the American Hotel. We hired Keith Greco, Judd Jackson, Rolo, some of the bartenders, like for instance, Joy Nicholson, who became a published writer, the tribes of Palos Verdes. Of course, the gorgeous Stacy Little that became my girlfriend for a couple of years. We blew up to the point of almost having 16 people working at the studio, most of them sourced out of the American Hotel. So it was convenient both ways, although inconvenient for George Rollins, who found it annoying that tenants from the American Hotel we're going into the building to work for me. If everybody remembers the war between the American Hotel and the Traction Building was when somebody put the line of demarcation down the middle of Hewitt. People had to decide what side they were gonna take. George loved the idea of being cool, but the actuality of it was annoying. <laughs>
at one point in my studio, what we were doing was insanely ass backwards successful. The traffic going through there would just be mind boggling. David Byrne, Mark Mothersbaugh did two years of work in our studio doing prints. I was always shocked and amazed that people found us and brought in projects that blew me away. Dennis Hopper was in there for six months doing 18 prints with us. And then at one point we decided to take one of the three studios and turn it into a gallery called Future Perfect. And the first show that we did was the first graffiti show in Los Angeles. And it was called The Most Loco Say Boys. Bob Zoll, Gary Panner, Chaz Bohorquez, who was just recently on the Mocha show on graffiti art. Shortly thereafter, the second show that we did made me feel really proud. I convinced Keith Haring to come out from New York and we did a show called Andy Mouse, which was a collaborative show between him and Andy Warhol. Phenomenal turnout, 5,000 people for a gallery space that was rated at 120 people. My landlord pissed off. Well, we had a riot. There was three fire trucks out there, about 20 police cars. I remember punching Jody Foster in the breast. Rolla was running the door and somebody pickpocketed him it wasn't an art show anymore, it was a riot. But Keith was awesome, because he was rolling joints and chasing Puerto Rican boys all over the loft. And didn't sell not one single piece of art, but got a lot of press. And then I closed the gallery. <laughs> there was a nightclub that blew up downtown called Power Tools. And at the first gig on Washington Boulevard, where they opened up in a small warehouse, there must have been like 30 people there. Four of which were David Bowie, Andy Warhol and a couple other fucking superstars that you're going, what are they doing slumming downtown? But that became the connective tissue that allowed me to go to New York and hook up with the East Village scene where I met Petty Astor, Keith Haring, and Jean-Michel Basquiat. And then I became a crash pad for people going back and forth. Jean-Michel would come in for three or four days, crash over there, my studio across the street. But I'd find myself being woken up at four in the morning by him asking me to drive him to skid roll so I can climb out of my car and score a bag of heroin and then drive him back to my studio and just watch him slam and then wander around aimlessly forever. So I had to kick him out. And it's one thing that I regret because if I let him stay there and let him paint all my doors like he did at everybody else's space, I'd be a multimillionaire. There's somebody up in the Hollywood Hills right now that when he needs a couple million dollars just unhinges one of his doors and hands it to a dealer. I had the unique opportunity to take a second floor with a wall of windows facing the American Hotel. So what we used to do in the evening, my girlfriend and I would pour ourselves some nice vodka tonics, turn off all the lights so nobody'd spot us, and stare at an array of windows where there was just vignettes of stories unfolding. Artists that were painting in their studio, but naked, which was a howl. Or Ron Athey on the top floor having some pretty wild sex with his boyfriend and then fist fighting. Or cooking by the windowsill. Or Keith Greco, young, naive, but hungry, obviously in the American hotel, sitting on his windowsill eating apples and us saying, is he gonna jump or is he gonna finish that apple? It was like watching TV. And I loved it. We all loved it. Basically, we were peeping toms. In comparison to premeditated $500,000 build-up bars that are happening downtown, it was just an armpit. But it was the coolest armpit. A really dark, dingy, dirty bar. <laughs> Scruffy and a makeshift stage, a bunch of skinny, hungry, wannabe, talking poets interrupting your conversations. <laughs> the pool table was pretty awesome because it's like, oh, you can drink and listen to the music. Kick it with the neighborhood. Everybody knew each other. And then the stragglers that would come in. I met Richard Edson there, who came up to our table and I just thought we were all cool and introduced himself. I knew him right away from the Jim Jarmus film, Stranger Than Paradise, which was one of my favorite films. But we became fast friends. But you wind up meeting people that way. I met and became really good friends with Phil Hartman from Saturday Night Live. It's just amazing who the fuck showed up there. 
you thought, okay, it's way too early for Hollywood to start slumming that early. I think the cool ones that were slumming were really cool. Do you think nobody's going to break out of this stinky ass bar downtown? It was surprising to see bands cut their teeth there. I remember I was in there with Jeff Ward, who was a drummer for Ministry, who, when he was on tour, would stay at my loft. And we went across the street at six o'clock. The sun's out <laughs> to have a beer. And this unknown band was doing a sound check. And it was annoying to me because I couldn't talk to my friend. And Jeff said, hold on a minute. He went over there, watched them for like 10 minutes and came back. And he said, that band is going to fucking blow up. I said, what's their name? He said, Rage Against the Machine. Trust me, that band's going to blow up. And it's the very same story for Wall of Voodoo. Every major punk band played there, the Plugs, Fear, just name them. It became the epicenter of the punk scene and the launch pad for a lot of major bands. And thinking how we discount each other because we're all scruffy and hungry until you find out who blows up, then it's pretty amazing to know that you were part of that community. Take two. Where's my fluffer, dude? You promised me a fluffer because I'm losing it. That's the bottle. Oh, sorry. Take four. Wait a minute. Time out. There's craft services, right? Otherwise, this is over. Take 13. Hit me. Okay, you said your nipples were hard. Yes, that's true. I'm ready for the last shot, which is the money shot. I dealt with my fluffer. Get me while it's there. Okay. <laughs> Scene 64, take 15. So my toupee is still in position, right? Looks good. Cool, let's roll. At the beginning of the 80s, this was a really small community. Everybody knew each other, right down to the personalities that were homeless. Uh, there was two or three key homeless people that became a facet of our community. And Lloyd, I always found the most interesting because he was harmless. I kind of found him to be like some street oracle that would just blurt out things that were like, whoa, that's heavy. I know that I should hate you after all you put me through. His area was Hewitt and Traction, which was the American Hotel, like all night. So to hear him talking to himself or staring at the light under the stairwell, I found him to be an engaging, harmless guy. Most of the time, he intimidated my girlfriends. <laughs> He'd always wear gray slacks, white shirt, and that pillbox hat, squarish on his head, almost like Amish. Early in the morning, I'd see him sweeping the front of the American Hotel on the Hewitt side, which was directly across from me. But that was the extent of him, because I'd never interact with him inside the American Hotel. Mine would be, from the outside, purely observer. But I recognize him right away as the seminal character attached to the American Hotel. I remember seeing him bringing food in in brown shopping bags, always alone. And I found out years later that he actually had a wife living in his room all those years, and I never saw them go in or out together. Another one of those strange things that you see on the Sci-Fi Jam. Walk out the door today, it's just mind-boggling what's out there in this intersection like five or six restaurants already. But back then it was Hilby's, and your selection was Subway sandwich, tuna, or mixed meat. That's it. <laughs> that was the gathering place way before Joel Bloom opened up the general store. Obnoxious motherfucker with a big heart. I knew he had it, but he loved to be a scoundrel and a mean-spirited person. Like the soup Nazi with Seinfeld, he'd like fucking scream you out of his store for no reason. I tried to maneuver through the world, try to be polite to everybody. And when I'd come across the street or anybody working in the studio for sandwiches, soda pop, cigarettes, whatever, they'd come back, some of the girls crying. For some people, it really hurts their feelings when somebody just rips into you. I could take a lot, but sometimes I'd just say, Joel, go fuck yourself and just walk out of his store, not give him my business. But you know, the girls that knew him, they said, you know, he's just a softy inside. It's just a rough exterior that he's projecting. It's like, get out of here. You didn't fucking rewind. You can't rent from me. Fuck you. While I'm at it, I will sell you cigarettes. <laughs> 
I tell you, it's a soup Nazi, you know, California version of it. <laughs> it was a Canadian group of acrobats that set up a tent on Alameda and wound up evolving into a billion dollar corporation called Cirque du Soleil. But the two weeks they were in the neighborhood trying to make an impression on Los Angeles, our neighborhood became their neighborhood. So this incredible interaction of all these contortionist acrobat young people mixing it up with other creative people, which were the artists, was a lot of fun for a couple of weeks or so. And I remember hosting a party before they departed back to Canada at my loft across the street from Mel's Bar that, for some strange reason, degraded into an insane coke party that went till four in the morning. And this is how crazy drunk and coked out we were. Unbeknownst to 14 people in my loft, a homeless person had climbed up the fire escape, gone into my bedroom, and I walked into the bedroom to get something for one of my guests and walked straight into this fool. I was frankly terrified. He flew out the window. I called my friends. Three of us ran out. We picked up bricks. I felt bad about this, but we started throwing bricks. We actually hit him on the head, but he kept going. And then we went back in, we f discovered that it was $25,000 worth of camera equipment stolen. So we called the cops. You know, we've just been robbed. And then it occurred to everybody that there's powder everywhere. Everybody's twitching like maniacs <laughs> and drunk. And now we're freaking out that fuck the stolen stuff. We're all about to get busted for doing coke. So it was nine people with spritzer bottles and sponges wiping everything down for like 20 minutes straight. So when the cops rolled in, they said, are you guys cleaning? <laughs> Everybody wants to find a place in their lifetime that just makes sense and gives them a sense of purpose. The epicenter, the center, was Traction and Hewitt. The Traction building, the American Hotel, was what was defining downtown for almost a decade. And all the tourists that started to come in here to pet the artists and throw them some peanuts, it was fun to watch and be part of. I always thought, you know, I never want to leave here. Don't you miss those days where you could survive downtown on less than 400, 500 bucks? Gas, food, 3,000 square foot lot, 10,000 square foot lot. Wow, those were the days. But you paid a price car battery disappearing once or twice a month, broken windows, chasing homeless people sleeping in your car, your girlfriend never wanting to come down. That was a trade-off. Cheap space, scary lifestyle. While I was in this neighborhood, it was the center of my world. After being down here for 11 years and seeing a cavalcade of personalities and artists, artists that crash and burn, artists that blow up and move out of town. It was time for me to go. It's what everybody was hoping for 30 years ago, which was enough gentrification to have a selection of restaurants and bars, an inflow of money, amenities for humans, and rich people that could buy your art so you could pay your rent. Everyone was hoping for that. And now everybody's dream has been fulfilled, and all we've got is dog shit all over the place, no place to park, and a bunch of trustafarians, as far as I'm concerned, walking around, pretending to be bohemians, running a loft that they don't make art in, and ignoring us geriatrics. We're the dinosaurs that cleared the path. And all they do is just say, excuse me, sir, can you get out of the way? Who are you, by the way? Aren't you a little old to be in this neighborhood? <laughs> progress, good or bad, is progress. Every generation has their moments and their experience and their community. So when I come around here, I try not to get too romantic and, and sentimental. Whatever's going on currently, well, it's their scene now. And some of it is entertaining, it's curious. You know, is it better that there's 10 restaurants around here and three bars within a block. I don't know. Sure, if you want choices. Isn't that what life is? Generations of people playing out their lives, their lives in community, their experiences, and it just goes on. We had our time, 
and every generation thinks their time is the time. Cut. I am doing what I do till I fall on my sword. I'm a master print maker and I'm also recognized as an artist and I'm just, uh, you know, chopping wood, carrying water. I'm just doing what I'm doing till I take a dirt nap by the farm, you know, meet my maker. 